Well, we are coming to the end of our series in Joseph. Um, last week, a lot of the tensions in the story resolved. And you might think at the end of that, that moment where Joseph meets his brothers and reveals himself, that that would be just a great place to end it. I wouldn't argue with you. It probably is a great place to end it, except the story goes on and, and this, in this kind of like epilogue kind of way. Uh, there's some other things that needed resolution uh, and, uh, in Joseph's life, and we get to see those things. Um, today we're going to be talking about when God crossed his hands. Um, I'll explain that as we go on. Up until this point, you'll remember Joseph had a tough life, started out great, went south at the age of 17, sold into slavery. Um, uh, he goes into slavery in Egypt. He excels in the house that he's put in. And then uh, a, a lie was told about him that ended up getting him thrown into prison. No justice for Joseph. Uh, there he is suffering in prison. In prison, he, he excels in, uh, in just doing work and helping. So he rises. Even within prison, he rises to ranks of leadership. He interprets the dreams of two prisoners. And he says, when you get out, don't forget me. Uh, the one, uh, when he got out, he did forget uh, Joseph. So there he was in prison two more years. Joseph then, uh, or the Pharaoh has a dream and he can't interpret it. And then the, the one prisoner was the cupbearer to the king, says, oh, now I remember how foolish of me. There's this guy in the prison that interprets dreams. And so they call Joseph and Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dreams that no one else could interpret. And the interpretation meant seven years of abundance in, in their economy, they were going to, their harvests were going to be bountiful, abundant, and in fact, they were so abundant uh, that no one could count how much there was. But he said, after the seven years, your dream also means that there'll be seven years of famine, and the famine will be so good, people will forget how great it was uh, in those, for those seven years. And that's exactly what happened. Pharaoh saw this, saw this wisdom in Joseph as he's interpreting the dream and says, well, who is a greater man of wisdom than this guy right here? Put him in charge. So Joseph goes from being prisoner to second in command throughout all of Egypt. And as uh, the years of abundance came, he managed that well. And then the years of famine came, and that's when the reun reunification with his family happened, his brothers. Finally, because there was no food, Jacob, Joseph's father, also comes back and he meets uh, Joseph. And we read in this verse this beautiful reunion story, this beautiful meeting where Joseph has seen his father, but he's like, Dad, I want you to meet my sons. And so he brings his kids to there. And here's Jacob. He's 130 years old. Your mom still has a little few more years to go. Uh, he's 130 years old. He's going blind. And he says this, I didn't think I'd even see you again, Joseph. And now I get to meet your sons. Can you imagine that? You grandparents in the room, you know exactly what jo uh, Jacob must have been feeling in that moment. What a powerful moment this was. And then what happens next is they're, they're, they're uh, just being with each other. You see, Joseph was just so overwhelmed with emotion. Again, this guy is probably a pretty emotional guy. We see him breaking down into tears multiple times in this story. And here he just falls down at his dad's feet, just so overcome with gratitude for what the Lord has done in his life. And then Jacob, as, as grandparents want to do always, wants to bless his children. Uh, bless these grandchildren. Uh, that's all the grandparents want for their kids. I heard, I think my dad told me that grandchildren are God's reward for not killing your children. <laughs> I'm like, thanks, dad. Um, every grandparent just wants the best for their grandkids. And here's Jacob, no different. He just wants the best for his grandchildren. And so he reaches out to bless them. Now, blessing in this time is a, it's, it's more than just saying, um, well, blessing in general, not only in that time, but in this time. To bless someone is to uh, point them with words in the direction of good favor on their life. It's to, it's to speak out a words of wanting the best for that person. The opposite of that is cursing, right? And cursing would be to speak out evil, say, I hope this horrible thing happens to you. But blessing is to, is to kind of almost as if your words could propel someone into a desirable future. That's what blessing is. And Jacob, that's what he's doing right here. And this is actually the first time in the scriptures where we see someone laying on their hands to bless somebody. After that, it, it, you find it a lot. 
especially in the New Testament, laying on hands to bless somebody. But here he is, he's, laying, he's going to lay his hands uh, to bless his grandchildren. Now, before we get to that, um, do you all, have you seen the movie, The Never Ending Story? Just stick a little finger up if you have, you know it. I'm like, oh, guys, this is classic. It's 1984, so it is everything that 1984 was in the film. Um, it's, it's, it, I, my kids probably couldn't watch it seriously today because the visual effects and all that are just of that era. But it's, uh, it's based on a book, and in the book, there's this kid named uh, Bastion who um, is reading this book. This is the really condensed version. He's reading this book, and as he's reading the book, he's beginning to realize, wait a second, these characters in the book seem like they're interacting with me. And as he continues reading this story of this fantastical land and this adventure that this uh, warrior child, Atreyu, goes on, it, he finds out, wait a second, I'm in this story. How is that possible? I'm, I'm being seen in this story. And he comes to find out that this whole world that he reads about in this book and the world that he's living in are not as far apart as what you would expect when you pick up a book. There's this powerful moment towards... Uh, right at the end of the movie where he realizes not only are they interacting with me somehow as if they were alive, but I'm in the story and I have a, I have a part to play in that very moment. The story of what we're reading here, I hope that you see it as the exact same thing because this isn't just a nice story of something that happened a long time ago. There's an incredible truth for us to interact with here this morning. Here is Jacob with his grandchildren in front of him. And in this culture, as we even read in uh, the catechism this morning, Jesus is seated at the right hand. To be sat at the right hand was the sign of first blessing, a primary blessing. And so Joseph, knowing this, he puts his older son, the one who would get the, 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 the primary inheritance, he puts his older son Manasseh at Jacob's right hand. And he puts his younger son, Ephraim, at his left hand. And old man Jacob, 130 years and half blind, as the scriptures say, he reaches out to go bless. And then something happens. His hands begin to tremble. And Jacob, before he reaches their heads, he crosses his hands so that the greater blessing goes to the younger and Joseph, he sees this, he's like, he, he rushes to him, he says, no, dad, that's not, you're mixing it up, you're blind, this old man, you, d fix your hands, it should go on this way. He says, stop, I know exactly what I'm doing. And he crosses his hands. He says, the, the one to whom the blessing did not belong has become the heir of the promise. It's a powerful moment. And this is the moment where you and I find ourselves right in the middle of the story. That we look at and we realize the story is talking about you and me, because when it came to us, God crossed his hands over your life. God crossed his hands over your life. Here's what I mean. You are not in the position to receive God's blessing. Neither am I. None of us are. None of us are, are in that position where it should come to us by right or by the nature of our status how good we are, how, uh, how even religious we might think of ourselves. We're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not strong enough. We don't have enough influence, and we're certainly no saints or hero. I don't know. Any saints in the room? I didn't think so. I still want to put a sign outside that says, only sinners welcome here. No saints or heroes. But here's this thing that gets echoed throughout Scripture. And every time you see something like that, this in the scriptures or hear this, I want you to, to remember you're finding yourself in the middle of the story. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians, that God chose what is weak in the world to shame the wise, what is a foolish in the world to shame the strong, what is insignificant and despised in the world to bring to nothing what is viewed as something. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here is the good news for you and me. God doesn't bless what the world pre-qualifies as worthy. I have never gotten so much spam mail, physical mail, than when I moved to back here to the States. I get junk mail all the time. 
and I probably get like 10 pre-qualified offers for credit cards a week. You get those? I don't know how they get it. And, and you know, at first, if you didn't know, you're like, wow, I got pre-qualified. It's a marketing trick. Don't buy it. It's all lies. But we tend to think like God blesses those who are pre-qualified to be blessed. You're good enough. You're strong enough. You're smart enough. We act this way with God so often that if I just get everything in, a, in all my ducks in a row, as it were, then I'm good enough and then God can bless me. But God doesn't bless what the world pre-qualifies as worthy. Strong statement here. Oh, what about when we've worked so hard to get pre-qualified? Uh, we've studied so that we can be smart and be seen as smart. We've practiced so that we can be seen as good and moral. We've made friends so that we can be influential. We've trained so that we could be strong and attractive. We've tried to get ourselves into the position to receive God's blessing. And then we say to ourselves somewhere in that internal dialogue, I'm pretty confident now that I'm good enough to be worthy of God's blessing. Be careful when that thought enters into your mind because God crosses his hands. He doesn't bless what the world pre-qualifies. Pursue all those things. Pursue, pursue education and being good and having influence. Uh, do if that's what's in your heart to do, but let this reality here sweetly humble you and at the same time lift you up that God looks beyond performance and he looks to our very hearts. I, for me, I don't know how it is for you, but real love sees me as I am. I imagine real love is not something that will ever be put in poetry, I'm sure, but like waking up early in the morning and you're still in your PJs and your hair is a mess and you haven't brushed your teeth yet and you're sitting there and the person you love is across from you and you're just enjoying each other's company without any pretense. I think love is sitting in the living room in your pajamas with another person. Just seeing you completely as you are. That's the way that God loves you. Just as you are. I know you came to church and you all look beautiful and handsome and attractive this morning, but God doesn't need that. He saw you when you rolled out of bed at 9.35 <laughs> and we're in a rush and you had to get to church because I got, you know, whatever, I got to be at church. He saw you then and he loved you just the same right then. God loves us just as we are. Here's this beautiful verse in Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us before we loved him, because of that love, he made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. It is gift. Gift. You're not in the position to be at the right hand and receive the blessing. You're not there. I'm not either. That there is nothing in us that pre-qualifies for that. And listen, if I had time to, I would love to just it just explains to you all that it means when God crosses his hands and the blessings that would have fallen on the sun now fall on us, what that means. Uh, it, uh, talk about how we can be forgiven of all of our sins, not only be forgiven in some like external sense, but be the removal of the shame that we feel for what we've done on the inside. I'm talking about a peace that's so great that it passes all understanding. Finding that love that will not let you go like we sing in the hymn. Finding vision and purpose that chase away the soul-numbing meaningless that we feel. Finding the light that breaks through the shroud of darkness and gloom. And that's just to name a few of the blessings that come to us when God crosses his hands. 
And, and that, that all that blessing isn't coming for the ones who are confident they deserve it. It's coming for the meek and the humble, the weak and the poor. That's just quoting Jesus from the Beatitudes. It's coming for the ones who the world did not pre-qualify, the ones that society cast to the fringes. This story is lifted off the pages and made alive in you and me, that God reached out to rest his hand of blessing, and we all thought his hand was passing us by because we were on the wrong side. But then he sent his son into the world, sent him to live among us, sent him to die in our place so that by him death itself might die. And God's hand began to move and the earth began to shake and the veil in the temple was torn in two and God crossed his hands. And the blessing due to God's one and only son, the firstborn over all creation, instead rested upon you and me. That is the gospel. And so when we see Jacob crossing his hands, that might just seem like a funny thing an old man did. I'm telling you, it's so much more. It's a, it's a, it's a sign of what was to come in Christ Jesus, that God passed over our sins, and the blessing that should fall upon him falls now upon us. And that is room not for running like Joseph did, saying, oh, no, God, you got this wrong. I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm not the oldest son. I haven't been doing things great. I, I fail. I trip up. I am not the model Christian that, that is deserving of this. And God says, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. The blessing that should come to the son now comes to you. So let this stir your heart of faith this morning that you can't do enough and you never could do enough. And it was never about you doing enough. God, when he looked at you, he crossed his hands and the blessings that would fall upon Jesus now fall upon you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. Oh God, I thank you that I couldn't that I couldn't do enough and put myself in the position to receive a blessing. But the blessing came to me when you crossed your hands. God, thank you that you've crossed your hands over my life. And Lord, I pray for all my friends here this morning, gathered online as well, that they even in this very moment, would find themselves caught in this story and would sense your hand crossing in front of them so that the blessing comes to them. It's a great thing you've done, one that we don't always understand and one we are most certain we do not deserve. But God, we still thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.